So maybe we'll start with an announcement. So I think you should have received, yesterday I sent an email to the mailing list. Did you all get it? So I resent, for people who were here last week, I resent the link to the virtual pod. So uh, I hope you all know what I'm talking about. I thought I would show it to you, but I don't have the link ready now. So this is this uh, special screen where you can write anonymously questions. So we will have a panel discussion today at 4.30. And uh, uh, yeah, we are happy to address, uh, or try to address, or uh, uh, questions that you might want to ask uh, through this virtual pod. And I don't know what I wanted to show you. I think Lucia is not here, right? I don't know. OK, so that was the announcement. So I'll go to the virtual pod and try to write uh, questions. You might have them. And uh, we'll tell you maybe later about the Thursday event and the information fair. So OK, so today it will be, in some sense, a connecting lectures. So I, I think, I hope um, you could follow the um, Sturmian sequences characterization, the characterization of these cutting sequences of a line with a square grid, which also called the linear flow on a square uh, or the linear flow on a torus. And uh, so first of all, I want to spend maybe the first 10, 15 minutes by telling you something which is uh, um, closer to kind of, uh, well, to my, it's actually my research and closer to what people have been doing more recently, uh, inspired by the square. And uh, then I want to connect through uh, translation surfaces and the world of IETs, where we will see yet another example of renormalization. So the first, uh, whatever I do on the board, I try to do slowly, and this is what I really want you to understand. Whatever I will do on the slides is more like a picture of what's going on uh, in closer research. So don't, if, you, if you get lost in the, this part, don't, don't worry. It's just to give you an idea of uh, what's next. And uh, let me tell you also the story of this. So I'm going to tell you something that we did with uh, um, John Smiley uh, a few years ago. And uh, uh, there's then a prosecution that I will mention, which is also joint work with Irene Pasquinelli, who is here, and another postdoc, Diana Davis. And uh, it all started because when I was an undergraduate student, I actually read this little paper by Caroline Siris, which I try to explain very much in detail to you. And when I read it, I don't know, I don't know if you liked it, but when I read it as an undergrad, I was like, wow, this is beautiful. It's this picture of normalization. I really fell in love with it. And so I kind of, I had it in my mind, and I kind of, and at some point we were discussing with John Smiley, and we were looking at the octagon. So, so you could ask yourself, okay, we started with the square, but uh, can I do it with other polygons? So let's see. Um, uh, what happens if I have uh, a regular octagon? And again, imagine that you glue, like we did in the torus, you glue opposite sides. You identify opposite side by a translation. And uh, if I have this octagon, like in the torus, when I uh, go out, I have to come back to the opposite side. So I can define a linear flow. Uh, let me show you a picture. So what do I do? I start from a point of my octagon, and I travel along a straight line with a certain slope. And when I hit the boundary, when I hit a side, like in the torus, I come back to the opposite side of the opposite side, OK? So you go out, come back, and you keep doing like this. When you go out, here B is glued to the opposite side B, so I come back, OK? Uh, okay, so I travel along a line and use the gluings of the opposite sides to come back. And what happens if I hit a, an angle? If I hit an angle, I stop. So the process is not well defined at angles. But I'm only going to care about lines which are by infinite. So I'm ignoring those which hit the corner. I'm just looking at by infinite trajectories. Okay? And you can prove those which hit the corner are actually countably many directions. So I'm ignoring a small set. 
And I can do the same thing we were doing with the line in a square. We can code it by recording the sequence of sides which are hit. So here, I had for the square, I had two pairs, 0 and 1. Here I have four pairs, and the alphabet here is A, B, C, D. You could use 0, 1, 2, 3. Just I had the slides A, B, C, D. So we can record a cutting sequence. So I travel along my line. Let's do an example. I travel, I cross the side A, I record an A. I cross the side B next, I record the B. Then I cross A again, uh, C, D. I can record in a bi-infinite sequence the pairs of glued sides that I hit. OK, clear the problem? And now you can ask exactly the same questions. Those sequences will not be random sequences in A, B, C, D. Can we characterize the sequences which appear? And if I tell you that a sequence is a cutting sequence of a line, can you find the direction of the line? And what we did with John Smiley, we gave a full answer to these two questions, exactly in the spirit of Caroline Siri's uh, presentation of Sturmian that we did yesterday and today. So really doing some geometric and combinatorial renormalization. And I was really happy because when I was a student, I was like, oh, I love this paper. And when I kind of find out I can, we can do something similar, I was really kind of enthusiastic. That, yeah, by in, but, so my, 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 I already told you this to people who were here last week. When you learn something, if you learn some little tool, try to, which is important to you, learn it well. Right? Understand it really deeply, understand it in, in, so sometimes tools which are yours are those that then you can export in your own research. So spend time to understand fully something in details until you have a clear picture in your mind. Because those pictures, you can carry them with you as your weapons to attack future research. OK, so we start by looking at, um, first of all, by some symmetry consideration. Well, we can actually just look at the upper, upper uh, half plane. And again, uh, you remember for the, for the square, uh, we were looking at the upper quadrant. And we had two types. We had elementary restrictions according to whether I was above in 0 pi 4 or in pi 4 pi, right? And these restrictions had to do with which sides can follow each other. Here I can only have, after a 0, I can have another 0. And the, OK, you can we remember. So we first do these elementary observations. I look at my geometry, and I make elementary observations. So let's assume here there will be eight types, not two types, but eight types, say 0 to 7. And each type corresponds to a small sector of, of, uh, of uh, um, angle pi over 8. So if my trajectory is in this blue sector, so horizontal to pi over 8, so, that's, so you can kind of, if you want, you can use the symmetries of the octagon to bring you back to this uh, small sector. It comes from symmetries of the octagon. Uh, if my trajectory is almost horizontal, and if it hits a side A, I cannot go up. If I'm almost horizontal, I'm bound to hit D next. Do you see? After an A, I have to hit a D. If my trajectory is not very more than pi over 8, I cannot go up. So I can only hit from A, I can hit a D. And I record this by putting an arrow from A to D. After an A, I have to see a D. Let's do another, another one. After the D, my trajectory, remember, is horizontal to pi over 8. I don't know exactly where. But after a D, I can hit a B or I can hit a A. But I cannot go down because I, I have to go in this sector. So after a D, I can hit a B or an A. Okay? And you can think what happens. After a B, you can hit a D or a C. And after a C, you can hit another C or a B, but you cannot hit anything down there. So I record this as a little diagram. And an elementary restriction is that my trajectory, my cutting sequence, has to uh, give me a pass on this diagram. So if I read through my sequence, uh, I, I, after an A, I can see a D. After a D, maybe I can see a B, maybe I can see an A, but I have to 
to, to, to reading my sequence gives me a pass on this graph. Does it make sense? So this is true if my slope is between zero and pi over eight. This is type zero. So the definition of type zero is being giving me a pass here. And you have to do the other types. You can just use the symmetries of the octagon to, per, to permute it if you want. You can do the same argument for the other eight octagon, eight uh, sectors. And you get a similar diagrams. If the direction is here, you have a similar graph, the zero. Well, these are eight possible types. And the first definition is a, a sequence is admissible if it is a, a, one of these eight types. So how does it work? Uh, uh, this corresponds to the two types. And the octagon and the first lemma, which is elementary in just indeed staring at your picture, what we just did is that an octagon cutting sequence is admissible. So if I have a cutting sequence, the slope will be in one of these eight sectors. And for that sector, I will have to live in that diagram, OK? So this is admissibility. It's more, a little more sophisticated than the square, but it's still elementary by looking at the picture and making some geometric consideration. So cutting sequences are admissible in this sense. Is this enough? No. We need an operation like derivation. We need to bring it to the next stage by asking this admissibility on many scales, on many levels. And this is, again, uh, you need a derivation operator like uh, we did for Sturmian. And I'll tell you what, this is kind of, um, maybe, maybe make magic, not magic, it's more surprising. I didn't, we didn't expect it when we started. OK, let me tell you, this is a combinatorial definition. So let me say that the letter is sandwiched. A letter is sandwiched, like C is sandwiched, if before and after I see the same letter. So C is like the ham in a sandwich of bees. So this letter is sandwiched. And now here our derivation, which is particularly beautiful in some sense. So it's, uh, given a cutting sequence, the derived sequence, omega prime, the derived sequence, is obtained by the following rule. Keep only sandwich letters. So let me see. This is an example. This is a sequence. And as I scan through my sequence, you see A is sandwiched. Great, I keep it. D is not sandwiched. It has A and B, so I drop it. B is not sandwiched, so I drop it. The next sandwich letter is a B, preceded and followed by C and so on. This, uh, you scan it, the next sandwich is A, then C sandwich, this B, D sandwich. OK, you scan and you keep only letters which are sandwiched. Okay? And now we say that an admissible sequence is derivable if the derivative by this, if I take my sequence, I keep only sandwich letters, and the new sequence of sandwich letters is admissible. So again, it lives in one of these eight possible types. And the sequence is infinitely derivable if I can do this infinitely many times. Yes? So we are kind of ignoring the place we start. So we, I also yesterday, you are looking at sequences up to shift. So I think by, inf by infinite sequence, you're right. So I don't know how to, where to put the center. And, I, I'm ignoring it. So if, yesterday also, if you wanted to do a more detailed analysis with where the center is, you need to work a little harder. Here we have never done it. So I just think of by infinite sequences, not as, uh, I do not place the zero. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is kind of surprising derivation. You don't know if you, uh, it comes from, but so what we proved is that octagon cutting sequences are infinitely derivable in this sense. So you see it's a theorem similar to in the flavor of the Sturmian. And it's not only for the octagon, it's for any regular 2 n gon. So decagon, do dodecagon, whatever. And uh, you can also do it for odd gons, like the pentagon. You have to take two of them. And OK, this is Diana Davis uh, did in her PhD thesis. And 
Okay, you remember yesterday we said it's almost an if and only if. So it's infinitely derivable if and only if it's in the closure of cutting sequences. This is not if and only if, not even for the closure. But we also have a second theorem which is if and only if. And this is in the spirit of the substitution version of Sturmian. So we also say we can explicitly tell you a recipe to write uh, substitutions such that a cutting sequence, uh, a sequence is in the closure of octagon cutting sequences, if and only if you can write it as this uh, uh, expression by substitution. I hope uh, you remember this is kind of what we did at the end of yesterday. So there exist some indices from one to seven and some letters or such that omega, I can write it as a limit of applying, oh sorry, 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 applying the substitutions to some periodic sequence. You remember this is the second formulation. This is an if and only if. Yes? Yes. Yeah, so there is this uh, little story. So actually, so uh, hexagons are uh, the same than squares. They are actually a square with a marked point. You can cut and paste a square into an hexagon. And our sandwich letters work well for the hexagon and gives you a different way to characterize. But actually, is Irene here? Yes. So this is, Irene came to Bristol to do a summer research project. And I think it's the first thing I asked you was indeed to check what happens for the hexagon and the square. And she started doing that. And then she read the paper by Smiley. And and then uh, I'll tell you what happened next in maybe, maybe in 20 minutes or so. But, and then we did, we, we had the research paper which started from uh, generalizing this octagon picture to something else, which will come next. I will tell you, okay. But, so you can ask Irene, she knows everything. She can give you her <laughs> stage thesis, yes. Okay, so um, ah, I, I'm lying something. I'm hiding some details under the carpet. In reality, the substitutions are not on the same alphabet, are on a different alphabet, and you need to change to convert them back to the standard alphabet at the back. And actually, this theorem does not appear in our paper of that time. It's something that I realized. Maybe it appears in your, in your thesis. Yes, so she wrote it. <laughs> Irene wrote this form, which I realized only some years later that you could do it with substitutions. Okay. Okay, and I want to tell you one key idea. So the key idea of this result is, oh, is the same, is the same. So what was the key idea? The key idea was to prove that an, the derived sequence of an octagon cutting sequence is again an octagon cutting sequence by giving it a geometric meaning. That was the key lemma for the torus. The derived sequence of a square cutting sequence is a square cutting sequence. And here we want to prove that the right sequence of an octagon cutting sequence is an octagon cutting sequence. How did we remember what we did it? How did we do it for yesterday? We compared the square cutting sequence with the parallelogram cutting sequence, right? And we, we proved that okay, maybe in k steps, then you get the derived sequence. And we also used kind of renormalization. So we need, but then this, each parallelogram, I can map it back to the square and restart the process. So what do you need to do the octagon? You need a geometric map to normalize the octagon. And luckily, such a map exists, and it's another kind of magic or beautiful thing which uh, was known uh, uh, to Vich, Bill Vich, who died recently, who was also a very important figure in the study of uh, interval exchange maps and translational surfaces. OK, so I will just show you one map. So, so if I take, let's take an octagon and let's apply to it this matrix. So this is, yesterday we used, do you remember, 1, 1, 0, 1 or some, uh, well, there is minus you can ignore, sorry. Say 1, then you have this 2, 1 plus square root of 2, 0, 1. This is a linear ma ma map. And if I apply my octagon, the image is sheared. So this is a horizontal shear of a certain amount. Okay, so I have an octagon and, I can, and the image is this. O prime is this image by this shear. And uh, you can see that I, I wrote my octagon in a grid made by rectangles and trapezoids. And uh, so this is just, if, if ignore the grid for a second, just the octagon is sheared here. And the magic of the octagon is that I can cut and paste, like a little puzzles, I can cut and paste the sheared octagon back to the original octagon. So 
So which remark this? This O prime octagon, you can draw it on paper and you can cut it along these lines that I drew. And your eight, nine pieces will reshuffle back to make an octagon. Okay, you can make a little puzzle like you made with the squares. So this sheared octagon can be cut and pasted back to the original octagon. And, uh, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, the key lemma is that, that the right sequence, this keeping the sandwich letters, actually gives you the cutting sequence of um, a certain line, the same line, the same trajectory, but with respect to the sides of this sheared octagon. Like yesterday, it was for the parallelogram. Here, uh, I can actually draw my line here. Uh, if the line, sorry, actually it's a lie. If the line is uh, in this uh, horizontal, if the line is in between 0, 5, or 8, I can draw my line here or draw my line inside there by this uh, puzzle. I can draw the line here and look at when it hits these uh, slanted sides. And it only hits the slanted sides where the original letters were sandwiched. This is what you want to check. This is the key lemma that I'm not going to tell you. But once you have that, you can normalize, renormalize. You can apply the inverse of my matrix. And a line here, by applying the inverse of the matrix, will map back there. So, uh, sorry, let me do it again. If I have my sheared octagon and I apply the inverse, the sheared octagon goes back to the octagon and the line changes. So, the derived sequence is actually, again, an octagon cutting sequence in a new direction. Okay. And then, from here, you can prove that cutting sequences are infinitely derivable and also all the other results that you want about the octagon. So I, I don't want to really explain this in detail, but I, want, I hope you see the analogy. I'm doing something very similar to what I was doing for the square, and it works for uh, regular polygons also. And I really need this uh, idea. Okay. And uh, now I want to move on, and I want to move to surfaces. So we already did this for the square. So you remember when I started with the square? I told you if I glue opposite sides of my square, I'm actually on a torus. And my line here is actually a trajectory of some flow on the torus. So I want to do the same for the octagon to start with. Okay, so if you got lost in the octagon part, ignore it. It was just for fun and to tell you something related to my research and the thing that people are still doing, I will tell you, related to this. So, so if you are lost, don't panic. Wake up and listen from now, okay? So it's a catch-up point. Okay, so this should, I, want, I think some people know, maybe not everybody know. So what happens if I look at my octagon and glue uh, this opposite side? So I glue A with A, B with B, C with C. Do you know what I have? Eh? Ah, so you're right, good question. I'm gluing by translation. So I'm, getting, I'm taking the unique translation which maps C into C. So I have a surface if I glue. You know what is the genus of this surface? Eh? Okay, so I don't know if everybody has seen this. I think not. So let me give you a movie, a movie. So if I have this octagon, what do mathematicians do? They reduce themselves to the previous case. So, so, so first of all, I want to claim, okay, that's my picture. I claim that this with glued sides is that. It's a pretzel, a surface of genus two. So how do we reduce to the previous case? I can fit my octagon in a square piece of paper, okay? What is an octagon? It's a square without, with cut out corners. It's a square where I cut out the corners. Actually, all this, this thing, it's, I think it's, I learned it from Anton Zorich, so I think it's good to, um, I, I, I draw the picture, but he has some pictures in his flat surfaces uh, survey paper. Okay, so what do you do once you have a square? For the square, 
We have to glue A with A all the, and C with C. So I hope you all believed yesterday that the square gives me a donut, a torus. What happens of these corners, these missing corners? The missing, missing corners glue to each other to make a little rhombus here. Does it make sense? So if you look at this picture, these little triangles form a, like a kite, a little kite. So I have a, a square is the torus, a square, a, a square with cut corners is a torus with a rhombus hole. So I need to cut a rhombus hole from my donut. And now, what do I have to do of this rhombus hole? Here I have B, and here I have D. So I need to glue B with D and D with D. I still have to do the gluings of the corners of the other four sides. So if I glue B with B, I'm left, I'm squashing, I'm squashing my rhombus and I have two holes with D as a boundary. And now you have to glue the two holes. And now it's a little movie, tick, tick, tick. When you glue, let me show it again. When you, you can deform your surface and glue them like this. And that's where you get the second handle and the pretzel, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, and your trajectories here will actually be a line. The in by infinite trajectory will be a by infinite line on this genus to surface. It will be a trajectory of some flow, as we will see now. Okay. So let's generalize this. So maybe let me give you. Uh, so take uh, a polygon and maybe take even a collection of polygons. I will stick to one, but you can take more than one. A collection of uh, polygon, polygons. Let's, I, I write it with one, but you can take two, three. But your polygon has to have the following property, such that for every side, for every E, for edge side of P, there exists another side, E prime, of the same parallel, parallel to E, and of the same length. Okay, so this is what we had for the octagon. So we had each side has a parallel side of same length. And, uh, and in addition, actually you want them, uh, I will not write formally this, but you want, uh, so this is good if you have a side like this, with the, which is to the right of your polygon and a side which is to the left of your polygon. This is okay, this is E prime. But you don't want, uh, you can have a polygon which has, I don't know, two sides, like this, this is no, you don't want this. You want them with, with on opposite sides of, the, of, the, of your polygon. You can say this by orienting your polygon and then you want the boundary to have, let's see, opposite orientation, same orientation, I mean, okay, the, the picture is, so you want them to, okay. And now you want to, so glue, Glue pairs E E prime by using the unique translation, like we did from the top, from the octagon. The unique translation in R two, which maps E to E prime. E prime. Okay, I just to I identify them by a translation. And maybe let me call it like this. S, I'm going to call it P modulo tilde, where this tilde is just the gluing of the sides. P is equal, is not tilde, is a surface. And actually it's what is called a translation surface. Okay. 
I will tell you in a second a more formal definition, but let me say it's a translation surface. Say translation, it's a surface, and it's a translation surface because say gluings are made by translations. So trans this it reminds you that uh, gluings are by translations. And let me, I don't know, give you any another example. You can, for example, take four sides, whichever vectors you want. Let's call them A, B, C, and D. I'm going to make a non-regular octagon with pairs of glue. So draw your favorite four vectors like this, and then say that we repeat them in the opposite order. So this is A, this is B, this is, you have to make them parallel. C, oh, and of course my picture is not good, but it will close up. If you take four vectors, the sum of four vectors will be, uh, what am I doing not so well? B, C, and D, something like this. And glue, yes? A is maybe too big. Uh, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, so you know, when, when I when you see when I'm gluing A with A, I'm, I want to make a piece of a plane. So if I glue two sides like this, I get a piece of the plane. If I glue two sides like that, I get a folded piece of a plane. I, w I want my gluing to give me some piece of a plane. That, that's what. Yes. Ah. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay, you just want this arrow here. Yes, yes, absolutely. You repeat the same, yeah, that's what, you, oh, thank you, Amy, for clarifying. I hadn't understood the question. Yes, thank you. I thought it was about this gluing here, but yes, okay. So this is, again, it's a surface of genus two, but it's a different, uh, okay, uh, let me say, let me make some, uh, um, let me make some remarks or maybe some uh, facts. So first of all, uh, we say that, so, so if P1 and P2, if you have two polygons, which can be obtained, can be obtained from each other uh, by cutting and pasting. I will give you an example in a second. By cutting and pasting. by translations. Let me give you an example that you already know. Say that your first polygon is P1, it's a square. <coughs> and your second polygon is the parallelogram. P2 is 1, 1, 0, 1 of the square. Okay, so imagine these two polygons, P1 and P2, each with opposite sides identified. You see that you can cut and paste one into the other. So if I take, um, um, if I take uh, this side, I can, I can, if I take this triangle, I can cut it, cut it along here, and move the triangle here by using the gluing by translation. I can identify this diagonal with that diagonal, and I get exactly the same polygon P1. So if two polygons differ by cutting and pasting where I move things by translations in the plane, then uh, I claim that the, I get actually the same surface. So. P the glue, if I glue opposite sides, I will get a surface. I cannot distinguish from which I came from. I get exactly the same translation surface. And uh, then, so I don't only get actually a surface. What I really get when I glue a polygon, it's more than a surface. I get a surface with a Euclidean, locally Euclidean structure. I get a surface which looks like the plane in, in almost all neighborhoods of points. So, so, two, this take as a, as a def I'm gonna give you in a second the definition of translation surface, but this is kind of, you can make a definition by polygons, we're taking this as an axiom. And uh, two is 
uh, S is locally Euclidean, or it's flat, locally Euclidean. So it has a flat metric, Euclidean metric, outside, outside, outside uh, vertices. Vertices of P. And what do I mean by this? So if I take a point in the interior, you all see that it has a neighborhood which is a piece of a plane. This is a Euclidean neighborhood. But, and if I take a point on C, which is also here, you can also find a very nice Euclidean neighborhood. These two things are identified and when I glue my edges, I see a piece of a plane, okay? So everything is like, every neighborhood on my surface, every point in my surface, unless I pick a vertex, has a nice Euclidean neighborhood. You can kind of build a surface by gluing pieces of paper, okay? And the consequence of this and the gluing by translations, it's also that there is a well-defined notion of direction, of direction theta. Theta, it, well, there is a well-defined notion of direction theta, so if I kind of go out here, I know when I come back, sorry, I know what does it mean to move in direction theta. Moving in direction theta is well-defined. So I can define uh, there is a flow a flow, which I'm going to call phi t theta, which moves at unit speed along lines in direction theta, in direction theta. And this is called the linear flow, or directional linear flow on the translation surface S, okay? So this is what I was plotting for the octagon before. Okay, I don't want to do anything, uh, I don't want to write at the board anything more than that. I really want you to think you have a, yes? Sorry? Locally Euclidean means that I have neighborhoods which are really like pieces of plane. Uh, okay, let me, let me read it if I, I say it now, so I don't know. So, I, so I'm very happy for you to think I have a polygon with opposite sides of equal lengths and parallel glued together, okay? So how many know the definition of a manifold in general with charts and transition with charts? Okay, quite many. So let me just tell you, I have one extra slide. So, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, this was, a, before I do that, I had one example of two polygons which give the same, and this other, there is another example of two polygons which are the same. This octagon and that octagon can be cutted and pasted into each other by translation. This is this puzzle magic that Ditch discovered. So if I glue this regular octagon or if I glue the sheared octagon by opposite sides, I get the same surface, the same translation surface. Okay, that was my second example here for fact one. Okay, so this is more formal definition. So a translation surface is the closed dimension to manifold, it's a surface with a locally Euclidean structure outside finitely many points. So what does it mean? Each point has a neighborhood isomorphic to R2 and the changing of coordinates before neighborhoods are translations. So you can write charts in R2 and when you have, you have to pass to one charge to another, if you've seen the definition of manifold, you know that there are transition maps between charts. These transition maps are translations over two. That's a formal definition. But this definition is not complete. Okay, this was my nice neighborhood. This was my uh, other nice neighborhood. The problem is I don't know what happens at this uh, uh, vertex. So in the octagon, you can check that all vertices actually correspond to a unique point in the manifold, in the surface. I don't want to spend time on this because I'm not going to use it, but I'm telling you for 
culture. So this, uh, in all the vertices are actually a unique point on the surface, and this point doesn't have a Euclidean neighborhood. It has a strange neighborhood which is called uh, conical angle singularity. So in, uh, and instead of having two pi around it, this blue point has actually, uh, uh, I think in this case it's uh, six pi angle. So uh, before closing up, I need to go three times around myself. So if you want a flat model of this point on the surface, it looks like something like this, where you have an excess of angle. Instead of having a piece of a plane, you have to take six pine of planes and bend them around to close them up. So that's a picture of a conical singularity. So the formal definition, it's a, a surface where transitions of, between charts are translations, and finitely many singularities look like this. And uh, every, so and also I wanted to say this linear flow, this going in a straight line, it's well defined everywhere but if you hit a vertex. So if you hit a vertex, I told you stop. Why? Because if these points are all the same, all these lines actually enter this vertex. So, you know, in a normal point, I have one way to go out and one way to come in in direction theta. Here you have many ways to enter this point. And if you want to extend this linear flow on these singularities, you have to put saddles. So what you, the linear flow looks like, it's a flow with saddle points on the surface. And that's reminiscent if you know about Euler Karate. If you know about Gauss Bonnet, you cannot have a flow without fixed points on a surface of genus 2. You need to have some fixed points. Okay, so this was a digression. If you got lost, let's stick to polygons. And maybe I think Amy had told me correctly. How do you know if I just give you a polygon what the genus of the surface is? I will tell you Euler magic formula. Euler magic formula. So if I take the number of uh, faces, number of faces in my, po if I have one polygon, I have one face. So in, a, in the case, the num number of polygons, if you want, number of polygons. Remove the number of edges, the number of pairs of edges, pairs of edges which are glued to each other, and add the number of vertices, but be careful that remember the vertices after gluings. So in the case of the octagon, it looks like there are eight vertices, but you can kind of convince yourself that this vertex is the same than this vertex using the identification of A, but D is actually the same than this, so it's also the same than this. So you can convince yourself that actually all these points are glued to a unique point. But if you compute number of polygons minus num number of pairs of edges plus number of vertices after identifications, this gives you 2 minus 2G, where G is the genus, the number of handles in your surface. So I don't know, maybe I did, let's check if it's right. Maybe I shouldn't check. One minus four plus one. <laughs> is it right? <laughs> two minus, uh, I should get genus two. Uh, okay, let me not check. <laughs> okay, hopefully it's the right formula. Okay, so you, there is a way, maybe I'll give you an exercise. There is a way to compute, uh, I don't know, the genus of your surface from the polygon. Okay. Mm. Okay, so now I want to say, uh, where are we? We are late. Okay, so it, it was very special. Maybe I will skip something. So it was very special to have, if I take a random, so, okay, maybe, oh, sorry. Uh, more, if you want to know more about flat surfaces, I can give you some references. Uh, the square and the octagon, because they were regular, but really because they are special, had something very special. So they had, um, uh, they had some linear or affine maps of the surface into itself. So we saw this for, so for the torus. 
So if I take the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, and I apply to the torus, you see, I get this parallelogram, but this parallelogram, I can cut and paste it back to the square. So I get a map of the square to the square, exactly like the cut map. This is a special case like the cut map. In the cut map that Amy did very carefully in the first lecture, if I apply an integer matrix to my square, I can have a map from the square to the square by going using mod 1, mod Z2, by identifying by integers. And this map, you can think of it as an automorphism of the torus. So there is a map from the torus to the torus, which is uh, linear. It's actually smooth, and he likes very much. So, and actually, you also have this uh, special affine map from the octagon surface to the octagon surface. So if I take the octagon, I shear it by this special matrix, the resulting octagon gives me the same surface. I can chop it back to the octagon. So I have a map uh, DFO from the octagon surface to the octagon surface, which is linear, locally linear. It's actually not smooth. Oh, well, we don't, don't discuss the singularities, but OK. And this is very special. The, and, and just for your own curiosity, these surfaces are called Vichy surfaces, the surfaces which have a lot of affine DFOs which are rich of a fine diffuse, are called rich surfaces. And rich means, uh, this is all digression, rich means that there are enough diffuse so that the linear parts generate a lattice in a cell to R. Okay. So this um, special, this, 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 if I draw a polygon at random like this, it will not have a nice affine diffuse. And people in the field of studying translation surfaces and in tech Muller dynamics have spent a lot of time trying to find polygons which are so special that they have a lot of affine diffuse. And this slide only wanted to, 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 to have like a, give you a taste of modern, very current research. So these special surfaces are special dynamically. For example, for the torus or for the rotation, we saw that uh, uh, trajectories of a rotation are either periodic or uh, dense and uniformly distributed. And this is a property which is quite rare in dynamics. Usually you have cases where there are trajectories which are neither dense nor uh, periodic. And all these uh, special surfaces with lots of affine diffuse have this very strong dichotomy like in Weyl theorem. Of what? Yes. Yes. So, well, prove it. No. Yes. I actually can. I, can, I have a very nice picture, but it's sort of billiard. But I can, I can show you a picture of a trajectory which is not. You can see that it's dense. I will show it tomorrow, maybe. And I cannot build it rigorously, but uh, yeah. But so, uh, okay. So, and I just said, I mean, this is like, it's just fun. So, you can actually. Um, you, people have been listing, so all, all the surfaces which are special, the square is special, regular polygons is special, which discovered it, and then there are some new families of special surfaces, and bow molar surfaces are others. There are and people like Kurt McMullen and uh, Alex Eskin and Alex Wright, so many people who are uh, big names in, in tech Muller dynamics are trying to discover new polygons which have uh, lots of affine diffuse. So having affine diffuse is rare, and people study and search for this very special uh, needle, how do you say, needle in a, in a, huh? in, a haystack. in a haystack. You're looking for this needle in a haystack, and there's lots of research on this, which is quite deep, very deep. Huh? And I'll give you one more example, which is beyond octagon, because I promised to tell you what we did with Irene. So this is another, um, it's a collection of polygons, this is one, and this is another. And you can glue them following numbers, one with one, two with two. And I told you, you can get a surface by gluing not one, by many, a collection of polygons. So this is one surface, and this is another surface. And these are called bow molar surfaces. They are surfaces which are glued out of um, semi-regular polygons. Polygons where sites have two types and some rotational symmetry. And okay, so let me just keep this. 
and these uh, bone molar surfaces also have a fine uh, diffuse, they have maps, so they're very special. And for those with, with Irene and Diana Davis, we, we did the same thing that we did for octagon and, and, and square. So you can look at linear trajectories of this linear flow and try to characterize cutting sequences through geometric renormalization. And, uh, uh, okay, you know, I just put it here because I wanted to advertise also, uh, also Irene's work. You can characterize these cutting sequences uh, very uh, with, with uh, substitutions. There are substitutions and you can, you can build these substitutions and build these sequences with substitution. Okay, this was my digression. Okay, and okay, so now I just want, I'm almost over, but let me do one more picture before, I don't know, am I, what did I start? I think I am out of time. So let me just say one thing. I'll show you one picture and then I'll stop. So what do we do when we don't have, so maybe let me make this remark. So typical or random, maybe say if you pick at random, your random poly, uh, translation surfaces, cannot be, don't have, don't, cannot be renormalized geometrically. Can, can't be renormalized geometrically by renormalized geometrically. Uh, maybe this is a lie. By a fine diffuse. By a fine diffuse. So what will we do tomorrow? Uh, so this point tomorrow. So we will go to Poincare maps, go to the Poincare map, to Poincare map of the flow. And I just put on this last slide. And the Poincare map I put on, I will explain this tomorrow. We start from here tomorrow. The Poincare map will be an uh, interval exchange transformation. This is like interval exchange map. We, will, we saw it briefly last week, but we will do it carefully tomorrow. We define interval exchanges tomorrow. And we will go to interval exchange, and then we will define a renormalization combinatorial, if you want, a renormalization algorithm for IETs. Okay? And uh, uh, okay, and, and this is what you do when you don't have, you, and this randomization is kind of a very powerful uh, tool for proving dynamical results about these flows and these interval exchanges. Okay, thanks, so we'll stop here.